go into the world. And tell every man that you meet, there is a man on the cross. A Catholic take. What do you need to know right now? A bold synthesis of inspiration and information. Keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous Catholic perspective. A Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Wars, rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and earthquakes in various places. All this is but the beginning of the sufferings. Are you ready? Because, in fact, there are wars and rumors of wars. There are famines, earthquakes. There was a flood. Oh, my heavens, we have to share this story. It's a horrible story. As many as 10,000 people are still missing. Let's pray for everyone involved. We'll be catching up on that in this hour. The beginning of the sufferings, but the saints will prevail. And today we're going to be talking about this and so much more. Chris Tomlinson is going to be on at 15 past from the European conservative. Boat after boat after boat hitting the shores of Europe of military-aged males. Where are the women? Where are the children? What's going on here? And who's doing something about this? Chris Tomlinson will catch us up on that at 15 past. But Gabriel Castillo from Gabby After Hours is back on the show at 30 past the hour. What do we do about it? Living in an age of confusion, of uh, distress, of anxiety. What shall we do? We shall become saints is the answer. Well, how do we do that in an era of confusion and heresy and apostasy and all the rest? Well, Gabriel Castillo is going to catch us up and teach us what it means to become saints in this time that we now live and find ourselves at 30 past the hour. So lots of stories to catch up on, to conversate about and dive into. We will, of course, link to everything in our show notes at the station of the cross dot com forward slash a C T. Let's begin in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known. That anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your Saint of the Day. St. John Chrysostom, pray for us. St. John was born in the 340s in Antioch and raised by his pious widowed mother. An excellent student, he learned under one of the greatest orators of the age and eventually gained the title Chrysostom, or golden-mouthed. John first became a monk, then a priest, and spent over a decade preaching in Syria. In 398, he reluctantly accepted the office of Archbishop of Constantinople, where he would already be a target for political intrigue, even had he not immediately embarked on a rigorous campaign of reform. In his renowned, sometimes hours-long sermons, among the greatest to bless the Church, St. John would expound upon the Holy Scriptures with tremendous clarity, condemning sin with as much ferocity as he encouraged virtue with kindness and charity, defending every element of Church teaching with equal energy and skill. His unwavering zeal made enemies in both Church and State, and he was exiled twice from his see. Formerly banished by the Emperor, St. John died of illness and exposure after a forced march to a new place of exile on September 14th, the Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross in the year 407. Almost immediately hailed as a saint, and as perhaps the greatest of the Greek Church Fathers, he was proclaimed a doctor of the Church in 451. In the modern Roman calendar, his feast is today, the eve of his death. But for centuries he was traditionally honored in both East and West on January 27th, the date his relics were translated to Constantinople. St. John Chrysostom pray for us. And now your headline news. The Daily Wire reports McCarthy announces formal impeachment inquiry against Joe Biden. In brief remarks at the U.S. Capitol, Speaker Kevin McCarthy said the impeachment inquiry will be led by Oversight Chairman James Comer in coordination with Judiciary Chairman Jim Jordan and Ways and Means Chairman Jason Smith. 
The announcement indicates a change of plans for McCarthy, who recently told Breitbart News that the House was moving forward with an impeachment inquiry, would be done with a floor vote, which was not guaranteed to succeed as some Republican members have expressed skepticism about the entire effort. Catholic News Agency reports Swiss bishops' study finds more than 1,000 cases of clergy sexual abuse. A a comprehensive year-long investigation into sexual abuse within the Catholic Church in Switzerland released Tuesday. The 136-page report documents 1,002 cases of abuse since the mid-20th century involving 510 accused and 921 victims. The Swiss Bishops' Conference commissioned the groundbreaking study by the University of Zurich's Historical Seminar. The research team cautioned that these figures represent only the tip of the iceberg, as numerous archives remain unevaluated. The study also highlighted a systematic cover-up within the church. Church criminal law was scarcely enforced for much of the study period. Instead, many cases were deliberately concealed or minimized. In further, it revealed that the church leaders often transferred accused clerics, sometimes internationally, to evade secular prosecution. The report summary indicated that 39% of the victims were female, while just under 56% were male. In almost all cases, the accused were men, and 74% of the evaluated files evidenced sexual abuse of minors. The New York Post reports whistleblower says CIA tried to pay off analysts to bury the COVID lab leak theory. A senior level CIA officer told House committee leaders that his agency tried to pay off six analysts who found that SARS-CoV-2 likely originated in a Wuhan lab if they changed their position and said the virus jumped from animals to humans, according to a letter sent Tuesday to the CIA director, William Burns. The U.S. Intelligence Committee declassified its 10-page report on COVID origins in June, which found biosafety concerns and genetic engineering taking place at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. But most of its agencies assessed that the SARS-CoV-2 was not genetically engineered. However, several scientists at the Wuhan lab also became sick in the fall of 2019 with symptoms consistent but not diagnostic of COVID-19. And those, those are your headline news. The gospel today comes to us on this feast day of St. John Chrysostom, Bishop and Doctor of the Church from Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 26. And he, lifting up his eyes on his disciples, said, Blessed are ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed shall you be when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sakes. Be glad in that day and rejoice, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For according to these things did their fathers to the prophets. But woe to you that are rich, for you have your consolation. And woe to you that are filled, for you shall hunger. Woe to you that now laugh, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when men shall bless you, for according to these things did their fathers to the false prophets. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Can I just give a quick shout out? Happy birthday, Damon. Today is Damon's birthday. It's also... uh, it's also Mrs. Kraft's birthday today, too. One of our, uh, one of our, let's just, can we call her one of our insiders, producer Jake? Is that okay? Can we call Mrs. Kraft one of our insiders? I think we she's absolutely can. Sort of hiding in the shadows sometimes, but nonetheless, <laughs> she is here. Praise be to God. I'm just teasing. I'm only teasing. Happy birthday. Thank you for uh, being on the team today. We really appreciate it. If you have a birthday coming up and you want to shout out, email producer Jake, ACT at the station of the cross.com, and we'll make sure to give you a shout out. But today is St. Chrysostom's birthday of sorts. It's his feast day, uh, and we are honoring him today. So I took only commentary from St. Chrysostom today. And he says, but godly sorrow is a great thing. And it worketh repentance to salvation. Hence, St. Paul, when he had no failings of his own to weep for, mourned for those of others. 
Such grief is the source of gladness, as it follows, for ye shall laugh. For if we do no good to those for whom we weep, we do good to ourselves. For he who thus weeps for the sins of others will not let his own go unwept for, but but the rather he will not easily fall into sin. Let us not be ever relaxing ourselves in this short life, lest we sigh in that which is eternal, in other words, hell. Let us not seek delights from which flow lamentation and much sorrow, but let us be saddened with sorrow, which brings forth pardon. We often find the Lord sorrowing, never laughing. Can I interpret that? How comfortable are you with this life? I mean, is this life good enough for you? You just really want a good time, a great time, a comfortable time, because that's what Christendom is talking about. Be careful in your pleasure, your leisure, your comfort, because you might get the fires of hell. Christendom will go on to say, great and little are measured by the dignity of the speaker. Let us inquire then who promised the great reward. If indeed a prophet or an apostle, little had been in his estimation great, But now it is the Lord in whose hands are eternal treasures and riches surpassing man's conception who has promised great reward. Be careful who you trust. Hmm. Chrysostom goes on to say, For this expression, woe, is always said in the scriptures to those who cannot escape from future punishment. Woe. He goes on to say, But tell me, why art thou distracting and wasting thyself away with pleasures, who must stand before the awful judgment and give an account of all things done here? St. Chrysostom has much to tell us about being prepared for judgment today. And let's not fall into the woe category. Let's ponder and seek first the kingdom of heaven. We'll be right back. Chris Tomlinson's up next. We're talking about immigration crisis in Europe. Speed to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's great to be on with you. Coming up at 30 past the hour, we're going to have a conversation with Gabriel Castillo from Gabby After Hours, personal friend of mine for many years, but also somebody I consider to be one of the greatest evangelists of our time today. We're going to be talking about what it means to become a saint in an era of confusion of teaching heterodox at the highest levels, of wars and rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes and pestilences and all the rest, the saints must prevail. How do we do that? Gabriel Castillo joins us at 30 past to talk about that. Do join us if you can. But uh, I'm seeing more and more these days uh, just insane videos of boatload after boatload of military-aged males hitting the shores of southern Europe and making their way across the continent, and it is very concerning. I've asked Chris Tomlinson from the European Conservative to join us this morning to discuss it. Good morning to you, Chris. Morning. Thanks for having me. Appreciate your time today, Chris. Uh, the European Conservative, you have uh, uh, several articles over there we're going to be linking to this morning in our own show notes. The European uh, Conservative can be found at europeanconservative.com. But uh, well, let's talk about the immigration crisis. First of all, I'm seeing these videos, boatload after boatload. Military-aged males. One of the first questions in my mind is, where are the women and children? Sadly, very few. Uh, We see maybe around 90 to 95 percent of the people who are coming illegally into Europe are men, usually between the ages of uh, 15 to 30. Um, But there are women and children that do come, and unfortunately, they usually come in very sad circumstances. For example, Pregnant women have been known to be put on boats by people smugglers in order to garner sympathy, in order to be rescued sooner, rather than just having a boatload of men. Uh, Other women have been forcibly sex trafficked uh, across the Mediterranean by gangs, primarily from countries like Nigeria, uh, in order to be forced into prostitution once they actually get to Europe. So there are women and children that are coming, uh, but unfortunately, it's a very sad circumstance in which they find themselves. Do we have a sense of the volume per day? Like in some of these video clips I'm seeing, I thought I saw it reported that at least 100 boats a day. Is that is that accurate or where, where are they out on the number? Uh, so, so yesterday was a record for Lampedusa, which is an island that lies just between Sicily, the island of Sicily and Tunisia. It's one of the most popular destinations for migrants who are going by boat uh, on their own. 
in order to try and reach Europe because it is so close to Tunisia. And so that has become sort of the hub of, of the migrant landings. And yesterday, over 100 boats arrived carrying around 5,000 migrants, which is a record number for, for Lampedusa ever. We've never seen numbers like this ever. And so this is added on to the already surging number of illegals that have come through the central Mediterranean route, which usually is from Tunisia and Libya to Italy, which already has passed 115,000 people. Hmm. Just to put that in perspective, last year was around 107,000 people for the entire year, which was the highest number since 2017. So we're, we're reaching levels now not seen since around 2016, when I believe there are around 170 to 180,000 people who arrived. And according to your own reportage over at the European Conservative, you have to couple on top of that with over a million refugees coming out of the Ukraine. Yes, exactly. And so the, what's going on is that we, we find that places like Germany tend to be the ideal places that a lot of these immigrants want to go. And so a lot of them will go through the central Mediterranean route, which now is around half of all of the illegal entries into Europe, according to the European uh, border agency Frontex. And so what we're seeing is a lot of these people either want to go to Germany or to France. And Germany has already been inundated with people seeking re uh, refugee status um, and, and uh, asylum from the war in Ukraine, meaning that the reception system in Germany is already completely full. It's been full for months, yet these people are still arriving uh, day after day after day. Uh, and, and many municipalities in Germany simply can't afford it, uh, nor do they have the physical space to be able to shelter and care for these people. You know, it seems to me, look from the outside looking in at Europe, that there is a mixed bag when it comes to the response to this crisis there. Um, can you give us a sense of who is against and wants to like really push back on uh, the immigration situation in Europe and who is really trying to open the floodgates? Well, it's a difficult topic because there are there are various countries uh, who are definitely against mass migration. Denmark is one, despite having a social democratic government. Poland is one. Hungary is obviously one. Italy, in name, appears to be one that is against mass migration. But from what we've seen the past couple of months with Prime Minister Giorgio Maloney's government, is that they've they've done a lot to negotiate these sort of broader treaties with Tunisia and trying to do the same with other countries, having the European Union involved. But not a lot has actually been done on the ground. We've seen more immigrants, more illegal arrivals this year under Georgia Maloney than we saw under the past government. And oh, wow. so th this is, you know, from a government that, uh, or from a prime minister, I should say, who prior to her election was talking about naval blockades and you know, drastic measures in order to reduce the number of illegal immigrants arriving in Italy. But since coming to power, it, it's had the opposite. And there have been more immigrants since, as I said, since around 2016, so despite the fact that she says that she is very much against illegal immigration, we've so far yet to see her do any concrete actions uh, in order to prevent these these people from landing in Italy. What are the what is the uh, what is the Dublin rule or Dublin policy when it comes to immigration? I was looking in your article, the German Social Democrats face internal conflict on surging illegal migration, which, again, we're going to be linking to from the European Conservative dot com website in our show notes but uh, so what are these rules? Because I guess they want them to stay wherever they hit. That's where they want them to stay. But that puts a huge burden upon that particular country. Yeah. So under the Dublin regulations, the immigrants who arrive in the European Union have to claim asylum in the first European Union member state that they arrive, which tends to be countries like Italy, Greece, Spain uh, and, and Poland and other countries that are along the European Union's uh, border. And so countries like Germany end up having these immigrants come to their country because they have much better social services, much better uh, job prospects than places like Italy and Spain. And so they will come there and then Germany will try and then deport them back to Italy or to Greece or to wherever the first country that they arrived in was. But these, these deportations tend to fail for a variety of reasons. But uh, that is basically the, the, the sort of cliff notes of how the Dublin system is supposed to work. 
But the European Union member states recently had a meeting on migration and discussed having a new mechanism in which European Union member states that are not on the borders either take in immigrants from these border states or they pay into a pool of money in order to look after these these people. And Poland uh, is set to have a referendum on this uh, in the coming month uh, because they are going to ask their citizens whether or not they agree with this uh, mechanism or whether Polish people should either be forced to accept more illegal immigrants or whether they should be forced to pay for them. Hmm. And where are these immigrants mostly from? Northern Africa? Do they come from the Middle East? I mean, is there like a particular hotspot that we're seeing more immigrants from than others? Yeah, interestingly enough, despite the fact that most of these immigrants are coming from Tunisia and Libya, Libyans and Tunisians are not the number one uh, ethnicity represented in in, in these uh, waves of migrants. What we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of Egyptians, a lot of people from Bangladesh, which is quite far away to seek asylum in Italy. Uh, we're seeing people from West Africa as well, especially in, in Lampedusa. A lot of the people are from sub-Saharan Africa, West Africa, and these areas. But uh, surprisingly, not a lot of people actually from North Africa. Hmm. So what can we do about this? What should they do about this? In your estimation, you know, it, it seems like we're not going to be stemming the tide of this immigration crisis. It seems like it's going to continue on more bureaucracy. But I'm guessing crime rates are on the rise in, in especially Italian cities and, uh, and elsewhere. So what could or should they be doing about this? Well, I think we have to look at it in, in two parts. We have to look at it in short term and long term. And right now, the Italian government under Giorgio Maloney is really only looking at the long term in terms of making treaties with uh, countries like Tunisia in order to try and stop the flow of, of migrants and looking at broader economic plans in order to, to stimulate economies in parts of Africa and other countries in order that gives the incentive not to leave the country in the first place. However, that, that is a long-term solution, a possible long-term solution, not a guaranteed one. But in the short term, we have to look at policies that were successful in the past. So in the pre previous government, uh, under the Five Star Movement and the League, headed by Matteo Salvini, they had migrant decrees in which they stopped the boats. And they were successful, not just at stopping the boats, but also at stopping deaths on the Mediterranean, which is also a problem. And we, we've seen well over a 1,000 deaths. On just on the central Mediterranean route this year, I believe. And so we need something in the short term. And that idea of doing something drastic and, and meaningful in the short term is something that no politicians are talking about currently. So they have no heart for this, really, <laughs> to get this, no resolve to get this done. Um, and I'm guessing the vast majority of these immigrants are all from, uh, from Islamic nations. They're all Muslims. Uh, most of them, yeah. Um, some of them are from uh, places like Eritrea, uh, which isn't uh, a majority uh, Islamic country, but many of them are. Yeah, absolutely. So that must have a, a big impact on what used to be Christendom all across Europe. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's having a, a drastic impact on local communities. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, you combine that with the fact that the vast majority of people in, in most of Europe now are you know, the uh, nuns in the sense that they don't have a religion, they just mock none on, on their uh, religious affiliation. Um, there is definitely a decline in, in, in Christianity, despite the fact that you have some of these immigrants that are likely either Christians who are uh, fleeing Islamic countries, a very small percentage of them. There are others who have converted to Christianity, whether that is genuine or whether that is just so that they don't get deported. I can't tell you, although I do know that it does happen. Uh, sure. So, yeah, there's a there's a multitude of factors. Absolutely, that's part of the reason why Spain had the Inquisition. By the way, was to figure that out: who is lying and who isn't lying, which I find utterly fascinating in these times. So, I mean, we're we're down to the wire here with Chris Tomlinson. Uh, EuropeanConservative.com is his is the website. There's a ton of great articles over there. We're going to link to his articles this morning in our show notes, but. We get down to the wire here. I think the last concern really is if war does kick off in the World War Three, uh, it looks like Russia is going to align with Iran and China. All of these Muslims that are now in European Europe's backyard. How do you think that's going to go? I think we're just going to see more and more disorder. Just what we saw on the streets of France in early July and late June. I think we're just going to see that more and more uh, across places like France, across places like Germany, 
Um, there's going to be civil unrest, especially if there's no money to afford these generous welfare payments that a lot of these people are receiving. Oof. Chris Thomason. I appreciate your reportage. Thank you, sir. The European Conservative is a great outlet for information going on all across Europe and beyond. Europe, European, EuropeanConservative.com, EuropeanConservative.com. Chris Thomason, God bless you. God love you. Have a great day, sir. God bless. Thank you. All right, we're going to link to that in the show notes at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. But coming up after the break, I've got more breaking news and stories, including including a a tragedy coming out of northern Africa, a flooding. 10,000 people are missing at this point. We'll share that story. But also, Gabriel Castillo is going to be on. Talk about how do we become saints in these confusing and dark times? That is the most important question, I think, and it's coming up next. Don't go anywhere. Hear what listeners are saying about the free iCatholic Radio mobile app. Through the iCatholic Radio app, I have listened to the sermons and teachings several times. The effect has been a deeper understanding of my faith and Catholic tradition. This app has truly been a blessing in my life and has increased my faith. Listen live or at your convenience to your favorite shows. Just search for iCatholic Radio in your app store today. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. Breitbart reports Libyan city buries 700 people killed in devastating floods as 10,000 are reported missing. Emergency workers uncovered hundreds of bodies as they dug through the wreckage of Libya's eastern city of Derna on Tuesday And 10,000 people were reported still missing after floodwaters broke through the dams and smashed through the city, washing away entire neighborhoods. At least 700 recovered bodies have been buried so far. Derna's ambulance authority put the current death toll at 2,300. But the toll is likely to be far higher in the thousands, said Tamar Ramadan, Libya envoy for the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. He told a U.N. briefing in Geneva by a video conference from Tunisia that at least 10,000 people are still missing. Let us pray for the repose of the souls that are lost. Just the News reported Pennsylvania schools close again in hunt for escaped convicted murderer. Owen J. Roberts School District in Pottstown in southeastern Pennsylvania said Tuesday that it will be closed as police search for escaped convicted murderer Danilo Calvacante whom officials say is now armed. The search already resulted in school in two school districts temporarily closing down last week. The Pennsylvania State Police sent out an emergency alert Tuesday stating that officials are searching for Cavalcante, who is armed with a weapon in South Coventry Township area. The residents are urged to secure their homes, avoid traveling, and review any surveillance cameras that they may have. Cavalcante, 34 years old, escaped from the Chester County Prison nearly two weeks ago after he was convicted of killing his former girlfriend. Cavalcante also had a warrant for his arrest in Brazil, his native country, for another alleged murder in 2017. Catholic Vote Reports X sues California over censorship law. Elon Musk's X Corp asked a California court on Friday to overturn a first-of-its-kind online content moderation law, arguing the measure pressures social media platforms to censor discourse viewed as problematic by state officials. The law requires social media companies to publicly disclose moderation practices around categories the state could label as misinformation, disinformation, extremism, radicalization, and hate speech. And those those are your your headline news. Hey, I was just seeing this uh, video posted on, on X. I, I hate calling it X, to be honest with you, but Twitter. On my Twitter feed, Chris Thomason actually shared this as well. And it's a video of these uh, Hasidic Jews harassing Christians and little tiny boys just uh, harassing these these adults and the adult Hasidic Jews doing nothing to stop them. Reminding me of the gospel today about those that are going to persecute you and hate you for 
the name of Jesus Christ. These are the times that we live in. The question is, what ought we to do about that? How do we live in difficult and dark times where, say, many in the church commit horrific crimes or teach heterodox positions or is sow the seeds of schism and division and confusion, and there's wars and rumors of wars? How ought we to live? I've invited Gabriel Castillo, one of the greatest uh, Catholic evangelists, in my opinion anyway, in our time, and our era, to be on with us. Gabriel, good morning to you. Good morning, Joe McLean. How are you this morning? Praise be to God. I am alive and that counts. How are you? Awesome. Me too. I'm I'm alive and kicking. I get up early in the morning for two people, God or my friend Joe McLean. So I'm oh. up early in the morning for both of you guys this morning. <laughs> Good news is you'll have access to confession later since you work at a church. But yes. nonetheless, uh, nonetheless, right. let's yes. let's talk about uh, let's talk about how to become saints. Let's talk about first why we should strive for sainthood. I argue, Gabriel. You can argue back if you yes. like, but I argue that the vast majority of Catholics on planet Earth have not made becoming an actual saint one of their life's goals. What would you say to that? I agree. I, I agree 100%. And I would even argue that 99.99% of us are complete. Like we think we're doing, even, even those of us who think we're doing good, we've got a firm foundation. We've got our sacramental life. We've got our, some penances that we're doing. I would argue that the devil in modern times has even uh, swept some of us under the rug to think we're doing better than we actually might be doing. Uh, but we can get into that in a moment. Yeah, don't you think we've become too complacent, too comfortable? I would argue that most Catholics are just very, pretty much happy. They're they're satisfied. They're content with this world. You know, as long as they got a little bit of money in the bank, in the back pocket, the skies are blue, humidity is low, sunshine is shining. Yes. Everything is good. Why rock the boat? Right. And... In- and a part of that is like the we kind of settle. We're like, well, I guess, it, and, and I said this to myself many times, I guess this is as good as it gets. Uh, my prayer life, I guess that's as good as it gets. I go frequently. I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I'm not, you know, living in mortal sin, et cetera. So I think there's, a, there's definitely a complacency and a settling that happens. So how do we get out of that? How do we bust so, out of our, <laughs> our lethargy? How do we get out of our comfort zone and get into this mode that says, I have to achieve heaven at all costs, and I have to help others get there too. So the first thing that we have to recognize is that if we receive the Eucharist, the Eucharist is God's answer to help us become a saint. When we receive Jesus in Holy Communion, St. Thomas Aquinas says that the primary effect is to make the soul like God. So if I'm receiving Holy Communion weekly, or even more than that by going to daily mass, I have to ask myself, why am I not a saint yet? St. Thomas tells us the problem, the problem is not in Jesus and the Eucharist. The Eucharist is working fine. There's an interior problem within myself. There's a great axiom that the scholars use. It's called lex orandi, lex credendi, lex vivendi. How I pray impacts what I believe, and that impacts how I live. So if the devil really wants to change the world for the worse, he's going to impact what we believe, and he's going to attack the way we pray. So if we've gone to Holy Communion and we haven't noticed changes in ourselves for the better, Thomas Aquinas gives us a couple of things that we can look at in our own lives, and then the last one, which is really what I would like to talk about this morning, that will really change our lives. So just briefly, if I'm going to Holy Communion, and I'm not being made a saint yet. In other words, I'm not becoming Christ because Christ is the only person who's going to fix the problems in the world. And Jesus's antidote was to not just make me a disciple, but to make me another Christ so that wherever I go, I can bring hope. I can bring peace. I can bring consolation. I can bring God's method of terrible human uh, catastrophes that we're suffering of God's method of fixing those. So if I'm living in mortal sin, you, you're you're not even on the right page. You've got to get mortal sin out of your life. You've got to make an act of the will to never commit a deliberate venial sin. I'm not talking about things that happen because you're caught off guard or it's a one-off because you're weak. I'm talking about am I making conscious choices that I know aren't good, but I'm going to do them anyways. If I'm doing those kind of things and then I'm going to Holy Communion saying, Lord, make me holy. I want to be your instrument. Well, I'm, I'm actually not trying to do your instrument. 
We have to have bodily mortification. Of course, we've got to control our passions. But the number one thing, and this is this shocked me when, I, and I just realized this in the past few months. The number one thing that most people, I would say, ninety nine point nine nine percent of Catholics, are not doing that is the game changer is a word that many people might not even have heard of before, but it's so critical. Mental prayer. All yeah. of the great doctors of the church, St. Alphonsus of Glory says, mental prayer is the way that every saint became a saint. All the saints in heaven are saints in heaven for, because of mental prayer. Alphonsus of Glory, doctor of moral theology, says, it is impossible to give up sin without mental prayer. Teresa of Avila says, when the devil sees that a person has begun the path of mental prayer, he knows that that path is lost. Teresa of Avila, the doctor of prayer in the church, she says, if you don't do mental prayer, which is 99 point, I didn't even know it existed before. If you don't do mental prayer, you don't even need demons because you're casting yourself into hell. Wow. So what is mental prayer? Why is it so important? What does it change? So again, all of these famous doctors, Ignatius Loyola is not a doctor of the church, but he says, when you do mental prayer, what happens is that your heart is expanded. Your ability to love grows. Tepidity or lukewarmness that we're suffering from in the church, that is dissipated because the heart is set on fire. St. Philip Neri, when he would do mental prayer, his heart would be so inflamed and beat so hard, almost out of his chest, that it changed the shape of his rib cage. And sometimes the entire room, you could feel vibrations because of what was happening in his soul due to mental prayer. So mental prayer, hearing the voice of God clearly, being able to sense his will, having a sense of the presence of God throughout your day, all of these things that we hear about in the New Testament, how the apostles after Pentecost were totally different people, the dynamism in the church was just exploding and growing despite all the paganism and persecution, all of that comes through mental prayer. And it is there is a short little process. Do you have any questions yet at this point, uh, Joe? Well, I want to talk about regulating our passions. You know, yes, we can't okay, get to, it. I don't, I argue we can't get to things like the discipline of mental prayer or the discipline yes. of, of, uh, you know, I would say even habitual prayer in our life. If we haven't conquered our passions or disordered passions, I myself recently lost 150 pounds. Glory be to God. Yes. It took a long time. I had carried that weight, uh, at my peak, I was well over 400 pounds and I had carried that for, for two decades, basically. So there's so much in our life that we need to focus on to yes. cut back on. And, and in one of your recent videos on, uh, on Steve Jobs, which I absolutely loved, mostly because you had this like cameo of this one guy in there preaching. Oh, man, he looks so good in that. Oh, suit. I love that. But that nonetheless, good, yes. I'm teasing. It was me. Anyway, nonetheless, I liked how we taught you talked about the issue of fasting. Steve Jobs, yes. you know, wrong only looked towards the East for truth. He should have found it in Christ. He, yeah. he looked elsewhere for it. But even they have have something that we seem to have lost, and that is fasting. Can you talk about that? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And there's two things that I want to point out. So earlier we were discussing, you know, we've got all these problems in the church, which is the body of Christ, if you think about it. So in a way, our health should reflect our physical health we would want the body of Christ to be healthy. We look at the body of Christ with kind of disgust because of the other members of the, of the body of Christ that are failing terribly. We have to actually look at our own physical bodies as if we are the body of Christ in our health, taking care of the body that God gave us is actually an integral part of being a good stewards of God's creation. So fasting and mortification on a regular basis is something that has absolutely been lost. Fridays, most people don't know that it has never changed that Fridays are days of penance. In the past, yes, they were days of abstinence where we would not eat meat, but they're still days of penance. So if we're not doing nothing at all in our mortifying of our appetites, it's very important that at the very least on Friday, we say, I'm either not gonna eat meat, I'm gonna skip a meal, I'm going to be doing something with my physical appetites to say no to myself, to control myself and to say, Lord, I offer you this little sacrifice. I'm going to do this one thing. And then from that, begin to build little mortifications throughout every single day, but especially on Fridays. So fasting does a lot of things for us. And 
the science is coming out. I have a friend who's going to be writing a book very soon. He's actually writing it now. He's going to get it published very soon. How all of these aesthetical practices, all of these practices such as fasting, going, skipping several meals, uh, or skipping a meal throughout each day, not eating for a 16 hour window, only eating in an eight hour window or only eating in a four hour window or fasting entire days and then eating the next day. All of these things are actually good for you physically. Not only are they good for you physically, but God has built it that what's good for the body is good for the soul. What's good for the soul is good for the body and you will be happier. You will be holier. Your prayers will get answered faster. The doctors of the church say that prayer is like our incense. It goes up before God, but fasting is the fire that makes that incense burn and smell amazing. Now I want to ask you, Joe, you said that you were for several years overweight and you you decided to make a change. What in it, what had happened in you? What happened in your heart that you said, finally, I'm going to do this. Ooh, just as that music rings, saved by the music, <laughs> as they <Yes>. say. <laughs> that music means we're up against a heartbreak. Gabriel Castillo is our guest. Gabby After Hours is his YouTube channel. But I'll answer that question on the other side of the break. We're talking about becoming saints in an era of confusion we're talking about, uh, you know, wars, rumors of wars, plagues, pestilences, earthquakes, floods, biblical proportion events that are happening in the world today. Just imagine if uh, high ranking members of the church committed grave crimes or taught heresy. Oh, yeah, that is happening, in fact. So, what do we do about that? How do we respond to that? All of that and more is coming up right after this break. Become saints is the answer. We're going to get Gabriel Castillo to weigh in on that in greater detail. Fasting is one of the big keys. It's all coming up next. Don't go anywhere. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McClain. It's great to be on with you. Coming up at the top of the hour, we say goodbye to the radio audience, but we stay on for the live video feed for another half hour for what we call the after show, where you get to drive the conversation. We talk about whatever you want to talk about in our after show. You can hang out with us at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT, where you'll find the show notes. You'll find more information about the, the the show itself, the podcast feed, and so much more. You can join the insider email list, which gives you access to the private telegram group and more at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. Gabriel Castillo is our guest. He has a YouTube channel, if you don't already know, which I'd be surprised if you didn't, called Gabby After Hours. It is an amazing uh, opportunity to encounter evangelization in a engaging way that you can share with friends and family. It is informative. It is entertaining. It is inspiring and so much more. Gabriel Castillo is our guest. Welcome back to the program, Gabe. Welcome, sir. And guess what? We've got our next documentary coming out on Gabi After Hours is going to be on St. Maximilian Kolbe, one of your Ooh. favorite saints. We yes. filmed to, we flew to Poland to film many parts <sighs> of it. It's, it's, it, am I honestly, honestly, I know I'm subjective because I'm the creator of it, but when I look <laughs> at it as a third party, I honestly, for me, it's the best documentary on Maximilian Colby ever made. So if you have wow. not subscribed there on YouTube at Gabby After Hours, I strongly encourage you to go check that out because it's going to be coming out soon. You don't want to miss it. Your content is the best, and uh, I am very grateful. It's benefited my family quite a bit, so thank you for, for putting up the God. effort oh, the, your uh, kids you are gonna and love your this. team yeah. do. So thank you for that. Praise be to God. You asked me a question about uh, yes. why I made that decision to to get serious a year ago. is just a little bit over a year ago now when I made the decision. I was already in intermittent fasting, but I decided that I was going to do two things a bit in late August of last year. I decided that I would eat only one meal a day. And I would o only eat meat or animal products, so eggs, things like that. And uh, so one meal a day, so one window of eating per day, no no snacking. And then I did that, and the weight fell off, basically. But what, what caused that? Why didn't I do that sooner? I wrote a book in 2014 called Muscle Memory, and it was about uh, the technique that I used to overcome pornography addiction. And uh, in that book, I talk about how many people I've talked to over the many years speaking at conferences and parishes and men's events and retreats all over the country and overseas. Uh, and I encounter people who suffer through pornography. And I knew that unless they were ready, they would not overcome it. Same thing with smoking or drinking yeah. or anything. If you're not at the point where you're ready to overcome that, you won't. 
You just you just won't. You have to want freedom, and uh, you have to want to kill the demon that harasses you in order yes. to over overcome it. I simply hadn't made that decision until a year ago. That's my answer. So. Uh, Teresa of Avila, this brings us back to mental prayer. So Teresa of Avila says that the interior faculties are primarily two. So you made an act of the will, and your will is one of your primary faculties. It sets you apart from an animal. You made a choice to do the hard thing. But before you could make that choice, your intellect, your imagination, your reasoning skills had to be informed and had to give your yourself, your will, enough information to say, I'm going to do this. I'm not turning back. And so Teresa of Avila would say the number one problem in the church, the number one reason that people don't fast, the number one reason that people don't commit themselves to prayer and mortification is a lack of an intellectual encounter with Christ that only happens in mental prayer. So I want to give your listeners at least three minutes of how to do mental prayer for a beginner. You've never even heard of this before. What is mental prayer and how is this going to change every aspect of my life? including my physical mortifications. Because if you have the right why, you might be willing to do any what, if you've got a good enough reason to do it. So Teresa of Avila says, and this is important for all prayer, the ve- it's three steps. The very first step of mental prayer is to call upon, and you should do this before your rosary, you should do this before mass. Call upon the Holy Spirit in humility. Holy Spirit, I can't pray. Come here, be with me. Lead me to the fullness of the truth. Second step, call upon St. Michael the Archangel to put his wings of protection around you. You don't have to say the full St. Michael prayer. Just call upon him. Because when you kneel down to pray, all of hell lines up against you. Because Teresa says that if you become the man or woman that God created you to be, you're going to save a thousand souls simply by the grace of coordinating your will with the will of God. And so you might be fighting for your own soul or for the soul of a loved one, but the demon is fighting for a thousand souls. And he wants to do that by discouragement and distraction. So when you kneel down to pray, you call upon the Holy Spirit, you call upon your guardian angel, you call upon St. Michael, briefly just say, my my patron saints pray for me. And then this is the most important thing to do in prayer that we do not do. Number one, we say, Blessed Mother, I consecrate this time of prayer to you. And you physically imagine her next to you, right in front of your face. You close your eyes. You imagine the face of the Virgin Mary, and Teresa says, and Ignatius and all the other saints say, this is so important for two reasons. One, our faith is real and incarnational, and if I imagine the face of the Virgin Mary just in front of my face, that doesn't even do justice to how close that she really is. So you're not pushing buttons in yourself. You're simply becoming aware of how close these people really are to you. Then you do the exact same thing with Jesus. This is the number one act in all prayer is to make an extraordinary act of faith in the presence of God. Jesus is everywhere. He is holding you into existence. If you're in the state of grace, you have God literally, really, truly inside of your soul because you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're physically a member of the body of Christ. You're simply, you're, you're a member, you're the foot. You want to get inspiration from the head. And so you, when you call to mind the presence of Christ and you visualize him, what happens is I can't give, like we get mad at our kids for not loving Christ and things like that. How, where, how are they going to encounter Christ? He lived 2,000 years ago. All the saints say you encounter him in the interior faculties, in the mind, in the imagination. And for many men, and myself included, I used to think, well, I don't have a good imagination. I have no way of accessing God in my mind, which is a lie from the devil himself, because the devil uses our imaginations to lead us into sin. You mentioned pornography addiction. Where did I would, I would form these mental pictures of naked women, and then that would inspire me to go look at more pictures on the internet. So our mm-hmm. imaginations are actually very powerful and very strong, but the devil wants us to say, no, they're not. If I were to imagine the face of Jim Caviezel's bloody body on the crucifix, I'd be able to call that to mind because my imagination is pretty strong. So the first step to mental prayer is getting the presence of God, really firmly having that. The second step to mental prayer, and the whole point of this, Teresa of Avila says, mental prayer is an encounter with Christ. It's a framework for an encounter with Christ. So I have Christ present with me. The second thing I do is I pick a, pick a spot for my meeting. So I'm going to meet with Jesus at the crucifix. I'm going to sit with him and we're going to have a face-to-face conversation where I pour my heart out to him about Whatever I want, because a lot of times we go to prayer, we're not real with God. We kind of throw up a prayer to an invisible force that we don't see. And we're going to look at him face to face, either on the cross, standing next to the cross. 
and I'm going to pour out my heart to him. And then I'm going to pause. And this is the most important part of prayer. I'm going to pause and I'm going to just let go and see what he has to say back to me. And I'm not going to hear words. I'm not going to have a uh, lightning flash before my physical eyes, but God uses the imagination with grace. So yes, I'm, I'm imagining that's a hundred percent true. And my imagination about Jesus is pretty good. He's a strong guy. He likes discipline. He's not going to, he's going to say, you know, suck it up, buttercup and carry your cross. I know that about him, but the Amen. most important thing that we have to call to mind is that Jesus Christ is alive and that with grace, he will inspire this internal image and he's going to encounter you. And he's going to, when he speaks, he acts. So when you're in your imagination, you know, like I'm just imagining. And he says, my brother, see this cross. This is just tailor made for you. You want to save your family? Come up here with me, climb on this cross. And it's yes, you're hearing that in your imagination, but you will know it's God because it's taken effect in your soul. And this is something that even a child can do. So Step one, presence of God. Step two, encounter Christ somewhere in the Bible. Step three, make resolutions to act on what you get in prayer. If you do this, your life's going to change 15 minutes a day. Amen. Praise be to God. Well said. Gabriel Castillo, I'm so grateful for your time today. Always an inspiration, sir. Thank you. Gabby After Hours is the YouTube channel. We're going to link to it in the show notes. You can search for it on YouTube, of course, Gabby After Hours. But if you go to thestationofthecross.com forward slash A-C-T, producer Jake, is going to be produce uh, is going to be producing the show notes here in just a few minutes, uh, pun intended. But anyway, Gabe, God bless you, my friend. Have a great God day. Thank you, my for your friend. Time. Have a good one. Take care. Bye bye. All right, we're going to see you in the after show tomorrow. Father Gerald Murray is on deck. We'll see you there too. God bless you. God love you. Share us with a friend.